1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So this is the basis for our church. One God, one church. So one God and one church, Lord. I mean, people, <laughs> Lord. The Lord knows that's what he wants, right? So um, that's our belief that we should be united under one bridegroom as one body because I say it a lot, Jesus doesn't want 35,000 brides, right? He prays for one. And we can all say, oh, the church is really just all the believers. But not really. He instituted a specific church. And our goal is to try to unite us all under that one church, one faith. All righty. So our format here, welcome if it's your first time. Just want to say welcome to you. Um, we're an online service at the moment, uh, twice a month. And we're not out to ask you to be a member and start making weekly, monthly, annual donations. You do what you want. Um, also, just, uh, just ask that you try to, if you're active in, a, in another church, that you go to your pastor or priest and start asking what they're doing to unite the community because like many movements, it has to start grassroots. So it has to start locally and start with you. And you spreading the word to others that you know about, hey, this is a, a good common cause for us to unite as one. And you can leave it to others, but then it may never get done. All right? So we just hope that you'll be people of action and that you'll take up this cause with us. Like I said, we, we follow a Catholic Mass format, and why do we do that? And you're going to hear more and more about that in the coming services. As a matter of fact, this service ties into the next two services. We're going to try to keep with our theme, all right? And um, our motto, which is the plain, simple truth. You're not going to be able to see this because it's very, very small, but... That's our card that we put on car windshields or car doors. It's one God, one church, and it says the plain, simple truth. We thank Karen for that saying. And of course, you can learn more about us here, www.ogoc.com. I'm sorry, www.og-oc.com. I miss that sometimes, and I've said it enough. I shouldn't do that. 800-428-8058, 800-428-8058, all right, folks, there's a lot there, hope you'll check it out, uh, back to our format, believe in Jesus Christ, the crucified Christ, and yes, he came down from the cross, but you know, we as flawed, failed human beings, we need to be reminded of things a lot, you just look to uh, professors or politicians or many people that speak, they repeat over and over again things, especially things they want us to remember, okay, because that's what we need. So we need to remember how Christ died for us. Yes, he died and resurrected and we're saved. Uh, not quite that easy, we don't believe, but yes, he died and he died a vicious death. And we should remember that each and every day. And that's what the Catholic Mass does, remembers that. And does a memorial to it each and every day. So it's through um, a mass, the Mass format, which is an opening prayer, uh, scriptures, uh, a sermon or homily, the Eucharistic prayer, all right, to prepare ourselves to receive our Lord Jesus Christ in body and blood. So we take communion. All right. And then we have a closing prayer where we, well, we do the Our Father. In the meantime, all, all that too. Sorry. 
Anyway, um, it's a Catholic Mass format, all right? And we hope that you will enjoy what you see and tell others, because that's the only way we grow, is by word of mouth, grassroots, just like we're asking you to do in your church, wherever you're going, all right? Okay. Is prepared today, I guess. Huh? I'm missing a page, all right, which is the opening prayer. Okay, so Father in heaven, we just want to come to you this morning, this day. We want to welcome you into our hearts, into our service. And pray, Lord Jesus Christ, and through your Holy Spirit that you have sent to us, through the Father, that this service um, be heard by those, especially those who need to hear it, and that they just be faithful to you, Lord. We say this by the power of your Holy Spirit, and in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, Amen. I don't know what happened, folks, on the same page, but anyway. So the reading, our first reading today is from Sirach, chapter 51, verses 12 to 20. And yes, you need an original Bible, the Catholic Bible. I know it might come to a shock to some of you as a shock, but that's the first Bible. The first Bible was the Catholic Bible. The first Bible translated from the Latin into English was the Catholic Bible before the King James Version happened, okay? So, again, Sirach chapter 51, verses 12 to 20. I thank the Lord and I praise Him. I bless the name of the Lord. When I was young and innocent, I sought wisdom openly in prayer. I prayed for her before the temple, and I will seek her until the end. And she flourished as a grape soon ripe. My heart delighted in her. My feet kept to level the level path, because from the earliest youth I was familiar with her. In the short time I paid heed, I met with great instruction. Since in this way I have profited, I will give my teacher grateful praise. I became resolutely devoted to her, the good I persistently strove for. My soul was tormented in seeking her. My hand opened her gate, and I came to know her secrets. I directed my soul to her, and in cl cleanness I attained to her. Okay. Again, that's Sirach, the original Bible. Thank you. So next, in keeping with Catholic tradition, all right, because I truthfully have been neglectful in following the true maths format, and I think it's because this part is usually sung and I didn't want to sing it. I don't know why, but I should at least read it, because in the early church, the psalms were, were sung. There were some psalms sung at every service, every mass, okay? So today we're going to read from Psalm 19, verses 8 to 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The decree of the Lord is trustworthy, giving wisdom to the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The command of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eye. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true, all of them just. They are more precious than gold than a heap of purest gold, sweeter also than syrup, or honey from the comb. And our gospel message today is from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 11, verses 27 to 23, 20, 33. And we announce the good news by saying, Alleluia, 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 the Gospel of the Lord, according to St. Mark. And in response we say, Glory to you, O Lord, Make the sign of the cross on our foreheads, on our lips, 
and on our hearts, all right? Mind, what comes out of this mouth of ours, and on our heart, the words of Jesus Christ, okay? So Jesus and his disciples returned once more to Jerusalem. As he was walking in the temple area, the chief, chief priests, the scribes, and the elders approached him and said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I shall ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was John's baptism of heavenly or human origin? Answer me. They discussed this among themselves and said, If we say of heavenly origin, he will say, Then why did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, they feared the crowd, for all they all thought, John was a prophet. So they said to Jesus in reply, We do not know. Then Jesus said to them, Neither shall I tell you by what authority I do these things. So you get a break today. You're going to listen to a much better speaker in Father Joseph from EWTN, all right? And I just love his humility, and I hope you do too. So... Do you know Father Joseph actually started at EWTN as an electrical engineer? Yeah, he was flipping channels one day and stopped on EWTN and Mother Angelica was on. And back in those early days in their early and mid-80s, Mother Angelica was probably pretty much all that was on. Okay? At the end of her program, she made an appeal asking for engineers to come help in their studios. So Joseph called EWTN and ended up going down for an interview. He was hired, and just look where he is today. Think about it. So there are no coincidences, are there? You should check out Father Joseph's story sometime. So we're going to let him speak, and then we'll get back to you. I always enjoy uh, reading or hearing the stories of conversions to Catholicism. And so last night I was reading another one of the stories in Roy Schumann's book, Honey from the Rock, 16 Jews Find Sweet in the Sweetness of Christ. And this is one I hadn't read before of Father Peter Sabbath. And then I later discovered online that Marcus Grody had actually interviewed him in 2004 on the journey home. Marcus had gone up to Canada, and one of the people he interviewed there was Father Peter Sabbath. And Father Peter talked about how he had grown up in Montreal. There's a large Jewish community there. I think he said 100,000. And but his family were really not practicing. He said they're equivalent to Christmas and Easter Catholics. You know, they would go to the occasional service. He had his bar mitzvah and those things, but that was about the extent of it. It wasn't something that really affected their lives. It was compartmentalized. It was over here. And he grew up in the, the 60s, went to Woodstock. He studied at Boston University, but as he's going through these studies and all of this, he said the question that I had to have an answer to was, I had to know why am I here on earth? You know, if I'm going to do what people typically do and have make a way of living and to have a family and so on, I first of have first of all have to know why am I here? Why am I here on this earth? A friend of his invite, in, invited him to go to this monastery where there were monks and they were chanting Gregorian chant, and he was very moved by that, very touched. He began to seek what he called was, it wasn't really God, he didn't like to use the word God, but more of like 
this, this power or this, the infinite. But it was a question that continued, he tried to resolve in his own mind and his heart. And uh, he would spend time in solitude and in prayer. And then something happened uh, later on that a friend invited him to go to the Oratory of St. Joseph there in Montreal. And as while he was there, he said, it seemed like the priest didn't really want to be there. It didn't seem like he was really interested. And I'd even thought about getting up and leaving. But then when that priest said the words of consecration and he elevated that host, I knew that I was a Christian. I knew that that really was the Lord present. And I knew then that I was to become a Christian. So it was something, he had this profound experience. Later on, his mother told him that, well, you know, we used to live near the oratory, and we would go up there sometimes just as a nice place to go. And one day it was raining, so we went up there, and we were in the oratory. For some reason, I've never done this before or after, I lit a, lit a candle for you. <laughs> was there at that very oratory during the Mass where he has this conversion to the faith. It wouldn't be until two years later that he would be baptized. He's at a monastery. He knew one of the monks and he said, no, I want to be baptized. And so the monk said, well, that's great. He said, but, uh, well, what are you waiting for? <laughs> Go ahead and baptize me. Well, there's a little more to it than that. You have to learn the faith. And so he did. He eventually continued to work at this retreat center and he went to Rome to study more about the faith. And he was asked in one of his interviews, he was asked, so were you still seeking? He was going to Rome, he's going to do some studies there. He said, no, my search had ended when I met Christ. What I continued, what continued was my desire to deepen my faith and understand it. But the search had ended. That's a good word, isn't it? He had encountered Christ, he had come to meet him, but now he wanted to understand it more deeply, to study the faith. And eventually he would obtain his doctorate in theology. And what was his thesis? Adoration and spiritual transformation. He had to write something on the Eucharist where he had had such a profound experience and conversion. Now today's first reading from the book of Sirach, we heard these words, I thank the Lord and I praise him. I bless the name of the Lord. When I was young and innocent, I sought wisdom openly in my prayer. I prayed for her before the temple and I will seek her until the end. I sought wisdom. So we know we live in a technological age and we have all of these devices that allow us to communicate across the world instantly and all these wonderful things can be used in a wonderful way, a good way. And yet that knowledge, that technical knowledge just is not enough. We need something more. The question that Father Peter Sabbath had as a young person why, I had to know why I was here on earth. We have to know, and wisdom is really, I want to know what is the meaning of my life? What is the goal of my life? Why am I here? How am I to be happy? How am I to live a fulfilled life? What is to be the direction of my life? That's wisdom. To come, to come to understand those things, how we are to live, what's the goal, what's the meaning and the purpose of life. That's wisdom. It enables us to see farther, not just limited to the technical, technical knowledge of the material world, as helpful as that might be. But you know, what is my end? Because we know our physical lives end here on earth. There must be something more. We have a sense there's something more than this. 
And within, we have these desires for the eternal, for the infinite, for love, for perfect love, beauty, goodness. And those desires point to their fulfillment, the fulfillment ultimately in God. So that's wisdom. It enables us to be able to see farther than just the limits of this world, that there's more than meets the eye. There's more going on. There's something greater than just the physical world that we perceive because by faith, by hope, and by love, we can see farther. That's the gift of wisdom. So in the book of Sirach, I thank the Lord and I praise him. I bless the name of the Lord. When I was young, I sought wisdom. I prayed for her and I'll seek her to the end. And isn't it interesting that Peter Sabbath was asked, well, were you still seeking when you went to do your studies? No, my search had ended when I met Christ. What, continu what I continued to desire was to deepen my faith and understand it. But the search had ended. And just a word, too, about today's gospel, that there are those who are interested in the truth, interested in wisdom, and there are those who are just out to get Jesus. Jesus knew the difference. And so one of the leaders at that time, a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin, was Nicodemus. And we read in chapter 3 of John's Gospel, Nicodemus approaches Jesus in this way, quite different from what we heard in today's Gospel. Nicodemus said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So he already perceives this, and he's approaching the Lord with this understanding there's something more going on here. God's at work in you. You couldn't do these things unless God was working through you. And so he's seeking understanding. Where here in today's gospel, they aren't. They're just looking for some kind of advantage. Well, if we say this, he'll say that. If we say this, it's just about this competition, this, this argument that they want to get into with the Lord. It's not anything about coming to know truth and understanding wisdom. So the Lord doesn't reply to them. He taught Nicodemus, as we read in chapter 3 in John's Gospel, about being born again. But here... We're not going to receive an answer since they have no intention really of following the way of wisdom or seeking it honestly. Now, I mentioned a number of these things today. We have the feast of Saint Pope Paul VI. And one of the things that I wanted to bring out today is something that's not really that well known about Pope Paul VI. And it was on February 22nd, 1967, that he announced a year of faith. Why did he do that? This was 1967, just the beginning of the year. He announced we're going to have a year of faith. Well, 67 is the year that Peter and Paul were martyred in Rome, 67 AD. So this was 1900 years later. 1967, the 19th centenary of their martyrdom in Rome. They both ended their lives in Rome. St. Peter's Basilica is built over the tomb of St. Peter. St. Paul outside the walls is built over the tomb of St. Paul. And it's interesting too that Peter Sabbath, when he went to Rome, he said, here I saw in Rome the convergence of history and the universality of the church. So you see the historical connection with St. Peter, St. Paul, but then you also saw all of these people from all over the world who were studying in Rome. So you saw the universality of it all together there, and that was something that affected him as well when he was in Rome. So it was in 1967, Pope Paul VI announces a year of faith. And at the conclusion of that year of faith, 
he said these words in a solemn mass on the feast of Saints Peter and Paul. He said, we dedicated this year to the commemoration of the Holy Apostles in order that we might give witness to our steadfast will to be faithful to the deposit of the faith. So what is the deposit of the faith? We know that public revelation ended with the death of the last apostle, but they have handed on to us this beautiful treasure of the faith. As we go through the centuries, we more deeply understand it. That was Peter's desire. I found Christ, but I want to more deeply understand. I want to study my faith. So over the centuries, through the saints and the doctors of the church and so on, we come to understand this deposit of the faith, which is sacred scripture, sacred tradition, the teachings of the church over the centuries. What is sacred tradition? Well, for example, what, what book should be in the Bible? That's sacred tradition. Or, for example, what are the basic elements of the mass, the liturgy? We see this all the way from the earliest days of the faith, the liturgy of the word, the liturgy of the Eucharist. So this faithful, this sacred deposit of the faith has been faithfully handed on all of these centuries. And in fact, Pope Paul VI refers to 1 Timothy 6.20. And St. Paul wrote, O Timothy, Guard what has been entrusted to you. And the Greek word that's used is paratheke, deposit. In 2 Timothy, Paul writes, Guard this rich trust with the help of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. So Pope Paul VI, he says he wants to bear witness to this deposit of the faith and to bear witness to it, to remain faithful to this deposit of the faith. And we must fulfill the mandate entrusted by Christ to Peter to confirm our brothers in the faith. And so what he's going to do, what he did on that day, was make a profession of faith, which was more explicit details, fleshing it out, if you will, the understanding and deepening of the understanding of the faith over the centuries taking as the basis the Nicene Creed that we pray on Sundays, but then making it more explicit in certain details. And the reason he felt it was necessary because of what was going on in the world that day and in the church at that time in the 60s. It was a time when there's a lot of chaos. He said, we cannot escape the influence of a world being profoundly changed. So many certainties are being disputed or discussed, and even Catholics are allowing themselves to be seized by a kind of passion for change and novelty. Yes, we must present the faith to successive generations in a way appealing to them, but at the same time, the greatest care must be taken to do no injury to the teachings of the Christian doctrine that would give rise, as is unfortunately seen in these days, to disturbance and perplexity in many faithful souls. So my dear people, we do have the deposit of the faith brought to us. And how can we come to know that? Pope St. John Paul II, together with the bishops throughout the world, put together the basics of our faith. He said it's a sure norm, sure norm for knowing our faith. We should read this regularly so that we can deepen our understanding of our encounter with Christ. Pope Benedict XVI made this little compendium, question and answer catechism, compendium of the Catholic Church. So those are two ways that we can especially know and be secure in the deposit of the faith and faithfully observe it. 
So we thank the Lord, and I encourage you too, you can go online and find very easily the credo of the people of God. So this was a profession of faith that Pope St. Paul VI promulgated, or he, he uh, said his profession of faith. One of my favorite things, and I'll conclude with this, is which, in which he talks about transubstantiation. And he says, after the sacrifice of the Mass, the Blessed Sacrament in the tabernacle remains the living heart of each of our churches. Think of that when you come into the Catholic Church before the tabernacle. The living heart of that church is his presence there. It is our very sweet duty and honor to adore the blessed host. the whole universe to himself. Wow, wasn't that inspiring? I mean, he covers a lot. He talks about different people to give his, put his examples. I mean, his the, the theme of his ser sermon into a better, more understandable perspective. Um, think about passing on, right? Depositing the tools of the faith. It's not just the Bible, folks. And if you believe that, you're truly missing out on what the apostles were taught by Jesus and what they taught their disciples. You're really missing out. I mean, Karen and I had the opportunity to speak with someone yesterday, uh, goes to a Protestant type denomination, and was talking to him about how I've been reading. Um, Eusebius's history, which I've mentioned before, his book tries to encompass all of the early church history, and I think it's somewhere around 280 or 300 AD that he sets out to encompass everything, and his hope was to do something and put it all into one book so that if historical documents were lost, people would still have a reference. And that was his goal. And I was talking to him about the history and, and just, uh, you know, one example was how he explains the, the, um, the difference between the Gospel of St. Luke and the Gospel of St. Matthew when it comes to the genealogy of Jesus through Joseph. And that some believe it's through the genealogy of Mary. And one, one is, and one is from the genealogy of Matt, Saint Matthew. I mean, of Joseph, Saint Joseph. So, um, what he goes on to explain is, back in history at the time, there were two ways to record history, or genealogy, I should say, through Jewish law. One was, by nature, I'm the father of this child. So. Um, just that child, right? Through this one woman, my wife. But we know they had many wives. And there was also a Jewish law besides nature that said you can also create genealogy through their law, which was, okay, I have a brother. He passes away. I take his wife into my home. She becomes my wife as, long, as well as my wife. Now I have a child with her too. I have a child with my wife. They're stepbrothers and they're from different mothers. Okay? And in some ways the Jewish law still looked at that as a child of my brother, not of mine. Because I was doing it in honor of my brother. Anyway, so the person's comment was, yeah, all I do is read the Bible. That's the only book I read. So. I just feel like people are really missing out. Just, that's what I said our next few services are going to be about. How you, if you are not really embracing the faith and looking back into history, how much you're missing. You know, we're taught 
we could do it from a political spectrum and say, oh my gosh, you know, they're eliminating history, they're eliminating historical figures, and we get upset, right? Because we know once they eliminate history, it will be repeated. Well, guess what, folks? When it comes to our church doctrine, we're eliminating history. So, um, just hope you'll watch that and listen and keep uh, Father Joseph's sermon in mind over the next two other services, and you'll see how they all connect, all right? And so, because that's our goal here, right? To keep one body, one faith, one God, one church. And that is what we're trying to do here. So now let's prepare to receive Christ in the Eucharist, all right? So pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours at home may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. And we say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy indeed, O Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> the fount of all holiness Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread, and giving thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the cup, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, giving thanks that you held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that by partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of your resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that we, merit, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ, and through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. So let us now say the prayer Jesus himself taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. So deliver us, Lord, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. <coughs> now.
Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who will live and reign forever and ever. Amen. So the peace of the Lord be with you always. And now let us offer each other the sign of peace. I forgot this last time, and I felt really bad. But I always wish my, the love of my life, my dear sweetheart Karen, peace. Peace be with you, sweetheart. I love you. <laughs> and we hope you will give sincere offering of peace to those around you at this moment. And think about those who can't be near you. Okay? <clears throat> so behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. And we all say, <clears throat> Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Now, folks, if you have it, your bread, your Eucharist, your wine, your grape juice, please take it in reverence to God with prayer. Okay? The body of Christ. blood of Christ. Okay, folks, I hope you take that seriously because it should be. And our God is, is a great God. And he's capable of anything, including making it so his, the presence of his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is in every Eucharist throughout the world. It's possible. Because anything is possible with God, right? So we'll now bow our heads for a final blessing. Alrighty? So having tasted your goodness, Lord, send us out as changed people, because we have shared the living bread and cannot remain the same. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace as you go out to serve him and each other. Amen. Thank you so much, folks. This uh, weekend, it's Memorial Day on Monday, so we just uh, lift up in prayer all those who have faithfully, faithfully served our nation, those who passed, and those who continue to faithfully serve our nation, because without them, we would not be a free country. We're so... Thank someone for serving whenever you see them. Okay? Thanks, folks. Bye-bye.